Welcome to Fuel Tank Safety Training. For this training, please have the Fuel Tank Safety Test printed out so that you can complete it during the video. As an overview to the training, we are going to cover history, affected regulations, ignition and flammability, design considerations, deficiencies, and implementation. The objectives of this class are to familiarize you with the different types of, e of fuel tank safety inspections and to introduce you to some concerns so that you can watch out for those as you visually inspect the aircraft in the future. The event that instigated the FAA to get serious about fuel tank safety initiatives was the inexplicable crash of TWA Flight 800 in 1996. To this day, no one truly knows why the 747 exploded and crashed into the Atlantic Ocean just minutes after taking off from New York City. Some conspiracy theorists believe that the aircraft was shot down with a missile and others believe that the explosion resulted from a spark that ignited the flammable fuel air vapors in the empty center fuel tank. The spark is suspected to have been caused when voltage jumped from high voltage wires into low voltage fuel quantity indication system wires and that led into the fuel tank. You can read there on the slide that since 1996 the FAA has issued more than 100 airworthiness directives and SFARs to mitigate in ignition sources and reduce the flammability of the tank. As a summary of other historical events, there have been about 17 fuel tank ignition events since 1959, and that has resulted in over 500 fatalities and 11 hull losses. You can see the causes of the events that are listed here. A significant amount of fuel tank incidents have occurred on military aircraft. You can see that the military has made some changes, for example with the type of fuel that they use and the dry run requirements on pumps because continuing to run fuel pumps with an empty fuel tank creates potential friction and then sparks and that will cause the pumps to fail more quickly and possibly ignite fuel vapors in the empty tanks. There are also some key commercial accidents that we're going to touch on. The first one happening in Maryland in 1963. This aircraft was struck by lightning and then that caused an empty wing tank to explode and the aircraft crashed. 81 people died in this accident. Another tragic event happened in Toronto after a pilot landed hard and then he immediately took off again without realizing the damage that he had caused to the aircraft. And then the aircraft fuel tank exploded because of the damage. I think the engine was damaged. And then the plane crashed and 106 people died in this accident. For this one, in 1989, a 727 crashed in Colombia because a small bomb went off in the cabin and that bomb triggered the fuel tank to explode and 107 people were killed in that crash. This bomb is suspected to be linked to the drug lord Pablo Escobar. A couple other fuel tank explosions occurred, one in the Philippines and another one in Thailand. These aircraft were not flying at the time of the explosion, so fewer people died during the accidents. In 
And then, of course, the ill-fated TWA Flight 800. The details of the crash are outlined here on this slide. So now we're going to move on to the regulations. The FAA issued a special federal aviation regulation, which we call an SFAR, in 2001. This was SFAR 88, and its purpose was to have the manufacturers or the type certificate, we call them TC, the TC holders, they had to do an evaluation of all their aircraft to see where improvements needed to be made in regards to fuel tank safety. The type certificate holders had about 18 months to do these evaluations. Then you'll notice down in phase two, the FAR rule implementation. These are other parts of the regulations that you see here, parts 25, 91, 121, 125, and 129. These were amended or revised so as to include better maintenance and inspection requirements of the fuel tank system. And then the operators now had three years to incorporate the changes into their maintenance programs. So we've got phase one and phase two. And now we'll look at a synopsis of the different things that happened um, from this rule. So this slide shows the course of events from when the rule was issued in 2001 down to the type certificate holders evaluations of their aircraft the changes in the airworthiness standards, the issuance of some advisory circulars, and then finally down to the operating requirements. So that last part is now the operators are doing all they can to ensure fuel tank safety in their maintenance and inspection programs. Now when it comes to major safety concerns, the FAA often issues a special federal aviation regulation, an SFAR, like we said before. It takes a really long time normally for regulations to be formally changed or created. So by using an SFAR, it allows the FAA to have a formalized process for a single action that can be enforced right away. So that way they don't have to wait a long time and they can quickly address a temporary situation without disrupting the entire aviation industry. So in addition to fuel tank safety that we've been talking about, other SFARs included issues applying to thrust reversers, aging airplanes, cargo doors, and icing. This chart shows a flow chart of the events that need to happen once the SFAR has been issued. So from the ignition sources at the top, that first box, it branches down into fleet compliance revalidation and fuel system inspection and maintenance. So you notice the fuel system inspection and maintenance trickles down really simply to the operators. They've got to implement the maintenance program. But then on the other side of the branch, the certificate holders review, that expands and branches down into a more complex system. So you see that it branches down into lessons learned and then changes in the maintenance program for the manufacturers to outline more effective inspections and mandatory maintenance and overhaul requirements. So it's up to the manufacturers to actually create the program. They create when you're supposed to do maintenance and when you're supposed to do overhaul and when you're supposed to do in inspections. It's real easy for the operators, they just follow the schedule, but it's up to the manufacturers to make the schedule. So the manufacturers had to revalidate all of the components on their aircraft, like the wiring and fuel pumps and the vent system. So they had to make sure all the pieces of the fuel system puzzle were w in working order. Okay, so what came out of this SFAR? Certificate holders, we'll start off with those guys, they had to evaluate their aircraft designs and then they had to make any changes along with updating the maintenance and inspection requirements. After those guys came the operators. The operators now have to implement any changes that the manufacturer said to do and 
finally, the FAA had to issue out any ADs as necessary. So we see all three different groups working together. The affected regulations you can see here, we have part 21, which talks about certification, part 25, which addresses airworthiness standards, and then parts 91, 121, 125, and 129, those are all the operating requirements for the operators of those types of aircraft. So like we said, part 21 outlines the certification procedures. There's not too much to say about this. It just tells you about the different certification procedures that need to happen for an aircraft to be certified. Some different models, for example, the ones that we have flown at Island Air, the ATR-72, and now we have the Bombardier-8s. We'll move on to part 25. That addresses three issues the ignition prevention, flammability, and airworthiness limitations of aircraft. Let's look more closely at ignition sources. Aircraft need to be created and inspected so as to prevent development of ignition sources within the fuel tank. There also needs to be a visible means to identify the critical features of the aircraft that, if those features were compromised, it could allow for a, an ignition event. So we need to mitigate these ignition sources. Now, CDCCL. Do you know what that means? What are CDCCLs? If you ever see a task labeled as a CDCCL task, those are items, uh, those items are features designed into the aircraft that prevent fuel tank ignition from happening. If any of these features are degraded, the aircraft may be subject to ignition. So we don't want these features to be degraded. We have to constantly inspect and maintain these features. Examples of what these features might be, specific explosion-proof features of a fuel pump, or transient suppression devices. They might have specific maintenance intervals to make sure that they're working. There's bonding jumpers, having them for one, and then having a minimum resistance level in them. And then, separating wiring going into the fuel tanks, for example, the fuel quantity indication system, that wiring is low voltage. We want to separate those low voltage wires from other high powered electrical circuits. You can separate them physically with distance or with a barrier. And speaking of the wiring, in some cases, manufacturers even identify fuel tank wiring with a different color. Pink is the typical standard color. B Bombardier does not have pink wiring, but other manufacturers do. The next thing we'll look at with part 25 is fuel vapor ignition sources. We'll start off with electrical arcs and sparks. Fuel tank wiring should remain separated from other high voltage wiring because voltage can jump. Voltage from lightning can also enter the aircraft wiring system, so there needs to be a, a means for this voltage to be shielded. And then another component called a transient suppression device. That device absorbs voltage spikes so that it keeps out the unwanted voltage from the fuel tanks. So why would a fuel tank spontaneously burst into flames? One reason could be the electrical arcs and sparks that cause from it. Another problem could be friction sparks. Like for example, when a pump is being run in a dry fuel tank, there's not much lubrication throughout the pump. It eventually starts to wear 
friction creates heat with, and sparks, and those could also cause ignition. The filament heating, number three, and number four, hot surface ignition or auto ignition, those things create um, heat, and in the aircraft, when heat is transmitted into the fuel tanks, it might cause the fuel air mixture to become more apt to explode with that added heat. So here are the sources of ignition. And this flow chart goes through the different sources of ignition. You see the components at the top. We have pumps, electrical components, and then lightning or electrostatic. And then you see the different ways that these devices create ignition sources. And in regards to flammability, the intent of this part is to minimize the exposure of fuel tanks to flammable vapors. One way to do that is to ensure the fuel tanks remain cool. In some cases, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but in some cases there are air cycle machines which are located directly below the fuel tanks. Um, the Q400's air cycle machine is in the back, so we don't have to worry about this in particular, but aircraft that do have air cycle machines immediately below their fuel tanks, the air cycle machines create a lot of heat, and that heat then transfers into the fuel tank, causing it to get really hot, and thus the vapors inside could explode. So there needs to be a means by which those fuel tanks are remaining cool. Okay, so as aircraft are being designed, there needs to be either one of these two requirements. The first one, there needs to be a means to minimize the development of flammable vapors in the fuel tanks. So in this situation, the likelihood of flammable vapors occurring in the fuel tanks needs to be reduced. Or, number two, there needs to be a means to mitigate the effects of an ignition of fuel vapors within the fuel tanks so that no damage caused by the ignition event will prevent the flight to continue safely and land safely. So either you get rid of the vapors altogether, or if there are vapors present when they explode, your aircraft needs to be strong enough to withhold that explosion. The final piece of part 25 is to discuss the airworthiness limitations, which have now been revised to ensure that fuel tank safety limitations are indeed included in the instructions for continued airworthiness. All right, moving on to FAA fuel tank safety initiatives. So we see here at the top, it says fuel tank safety at the top of our flow chart. Go down to the bottom of the flow chart. You see four things there. The results of this fuel tank safety initiative is four things. Improved design, recommended maintenance, a better inspection program, and revised maintenance program. So there needs to be a fleet review to make sure that all the aircraft were indeed compliant with aircraft fuel tank safety. So now that there are improved standards, all the aircraft needed to be looked at one more time. So let's move on to some considerations here. How can an inspection prove that an aircraft is safe. What are some things to look for? So we can start here with the separation and shielding approach. 
we need to make sure that our wires are protected. So especially the wires that are internal to the fuel tank. Those wires need to be separated and shielded from other high voltage circuits outside the fuel tank. In some cases, routing AC 115 volt and DC 28 volt wires together was found. So this is not acceptable. AC and DC wires need to be routed separately away from each other. There needs to be a visible means to identify wire separation. So if we can actually look at and see that these wires are separate, then we know we have a good situation. We have to main, make sure all wiring, even those included with the line replaceable units, are also separate. And then we need to make sure that if maintenance errors do occur, that there's some way to address those problems maybe with a second set of eyes or a different inspection. In some cases, operators choose to install transient suppression devices so that the voltage is not induced into the fuel tank um, through the fuel quantity indication system. Other considerations include electrical it's important to have a redundant bond path. That way electricity can travel out of the fuel tanks with several different ways. It's important to make sure the bonding jumpers do not have any corrosion on them. They can fail due to corrosion. And if there is any energy introduced into the fuel tank, it needs to be very, very minuscule. They're talking 200 microjoules. I'm not sure how to quantify that, but it's very small. Other considerations include fuel pumps. It's important not to run the fuel pumps dry. When the fuel tank is empty, the fuel pumps need to turn off. A feature that the Q400 has is when the fuel in the tank reaches a certain low level limit, the fuel pumps will automatically turn off. We also talked about the pneumatic system. For example, the air cycle machines create a lot of heat. If they're next to the fuel tank, that would cause the fuel tank to get too hot. So there are ways that manufacturers have to um, limit the amount of heat introduced into the fuel tank. Earlier we mentioned the fuel tank explosion that occurred on an aircraft in Thailand. Investigators have linked the explosion to running fuel pumps with an empty tank. Now conspiracy theorists, they raise their voices again here because they think it was sabotage. The Thai Prime Minister was scheduled to board this flight, but a deeper look into this was that the fuel pumps were run dry on an empty tank, so that caused friction which ignited the fuel tanks. Now there is definitely a need for all these regulations to be bumped up because after an in extensive inspection of several aircraft, there were nearly 1,000 discrepancies found on all these aircraft. The following list in the next couple of slides, we're going to summarize the discrepancies. But in spite of all these regulations and policies and maintenance and inspection programs, Hundreds of problems still were found, so we definitely have a big job ahead of us to ensure fuel tank safety. So let's start off with the pumps. There are several problems found with fuel pumps. The first one, ingestion of the pump inducer into the pump impeller, and that generated debris. The pump inlet case was degraded. 
stator windings were failing. Thermal protective features were deactivated. The pump manufacturer did not include a cooling port tube between the pump assembly and the pump motor. There was extensive dry running of fuel pumps in empty fuel tanks, which was contrary to the manufacturer's recommended procedures. Some pumps had steel impellers, and those could produce sparks if debris entered the pump. In some pumps, there was debris lodged inside. In some situations, there was arcing due to exposure of electrical connectors within the pump. Some thermal switches were resetting over time to a higher trimp temperature, thus allowing the temperatures to be higher inside the pump that could cause sparks. Some flame arresters were falling out of their respective mountings. Internal wires were coming in contact with the pump rotating group. There was poor bonding across the components. There was insufficient ground fault current protection. And there was poor bonding of components to the structure. So we see here some of these were maintenance problems that where the maintenance department or the overhaul was not done properly. And some of these features were problems inherent to the pumps themselves. In addition, we've got wiring to the pumps in conduits. Those, the Teflon sleeving was worn out. The pump connectors, there was arcing at the connectors because there was bent pins or corrosion. And then some, in some cases there was fuel leakage and that caused the connectors to corrode. Some of the connectors, and this may not be up to maintenance, but some of the connectors were improperly designed with the wrong type of materials. So here we see different problems. We've got arcing. You see the holes here caused by arcing. You see the impeller with heat damage was pretty much ground all the way down. You see chafed wires which can cause arcing as well. So these were all problems found in these aircraft. Some more issues. We've got wiring degraded in the fuel quantity indication system. Some of the wires were unshielded and then they were subject to high voltage. Some of the fuel quantity probes had corroded or had sulfide deposits on them. Some of the clamps uh, were damaged. And then contamination in the fuel tanks caused a reduced arc path between the fuel quantity indication system probe walls because there was debris inside. Other deficiencies were bonding straps. They were either corroded, loose, or improperly grounded. Uh, the static bonds on the fuel tank system plumbing connections inside the fuel tank were worn out due to mechanical wear. Um, there was the wrong type of material that actually held an electrostatic buildup instead of letting it be released. And then fuel nozzles were spraying improperly, and that caused some issues as well. So now we're moving on to the implementation. The implementation occurs with the operators. Whenever an operator makes repairs or does anything to the aircraft, those things should not adversely affect the fuel tank system safety. It's important to keep good repair records, but sometimes those do get um, thrown away because they're not maintained properly. We need to make sure that all repairs are done properly.
Now in some cases operators need to install different pumps or they have to route the wires differently or add more bonding leads and they install transient suppression devices into the fuel quantity indication system. These are examples of how the operator can implement these fuel tank safety requirements. Now when it comes time for fuel tanks to be inspected, it is important to remove all the oxygen out of the tanks, but that creates an empty space, so we need to replace the space that the oxygen took up with an inert gas, we, like nitrogen, so this is called fuel tank inerting. Maintenance providers will require operators to ensure that the fuel tanks are inerted before any inspections will take place. For example, when Island Air had the ATRs, they had to do a 12-month check which included checking the fuel tanks. That heavy maintenance provider required Island Air to inert the tanks before sending the aircraft over for inspection. The last part of this slide explains that the military used to have on-wing inerting systems. Those systems weighed thousands of pounds in the past, so for commercial operators to use those, it wasn't really viable. But recently, technology has advanced, and now some aircraft do have on-wing inerting systems. They only weigh 200 pounds versus the several thousand pounds from the past. So that's interesting. Something about inspection, it's an arduous task. If you're inspecting the fuel tanks, be very careful and make sure to utilize the proper safety equipment. And one interesting piece of trivia regarding fuel tanks, some intuitive and mindful Vietnamese people have repurposed old fuel tanks and turned them into boats and canoes. I think it would be pretty neat to have a B-52 bomber fuel tank boat, wouldn't you? All right, time to review the objectives. So, what different types of inspections should you be aware of? And what are some concerns that you should watch out for now as you visually inspect the aircraft, whether it be a formal inspection or just informally during your duties? So go ahead and write your answers down on your test and then finish up any of the other questions from the test. And then you can turn your test into the maintenance training manager's desk directly or you can turn it into the records, records office inbox. That inbox is located on the wall on the hangar side of the records office door. Okay, everybody, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.